Good evening. I'm Kate France. And I'm Tabby Tyler. Tonight we talk about the moral implications of prison labor. So grab a beverage. It's time for a night in. I think this is the week of um, this incredible movement where people are realizing that it's a marathon and not a sprint. Mm -hmm. Because for the past two weeks, you know, you've had groups from all across the country, groups from all around the world suddenly pitching in. There's this fever pitch, really, of energy coming from all sides, just everyone trying to throw in. Um, But the reality of a you know, attempt to change the way our society functions on on every level, let's be be real here, to support the black community. We have to change the way we do things so that white supremacy isn't the way we do things. Mm -hmm. And this week, you know, some of that fever pitch has kind of died down. And people are realizing, oh, okay, well, I can't just donate $500 to this cause and, and have fixed racism. Um, <laughs> we've got to come mm-hmm. up with some some long-term strategies. Yeah, yeah. and w- we talked last week about the long-term strategy of, of voting and how voting is never ending. There's always voting cycles. There's always people up for office. And even if they seem not important, remember, your local governor is the one who makes contracts with, you know, with the police union. So every single person is important. And like you said, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and it's never ending. And voting is one aspect of that. Another aspect that we're going to talk about today is uh, spending your money differently. Yeah, it's a different kind of casting your ballot, really, because, Mm -hmm. you know, we're a capitalist society, just the same way we have to let our representatives know what we want, because that's where half of the power in this country comes from. The other half is from the almighty dollar and the corporations Mm -hmm. uh, that are influencing lawmakers the same way we are. So Mm -hmm. we got to let them know what we support by spending accordingly. Yeah, and there's been a lot of... uh... There's been a lot of information on social media, info, uh, pictures that people post on Instagram saying, like, these are businesses you should support, whole things on Facebook, things on Twitter, supporting uh, ethical businesses, humane businesses, supporting black businesses. Small businesses. Small businesses, (laughs) thank you. Yeah, and and I mean, there's a power there. The idea behind this, you know, money ballot movement is absolutely there because Americans are spending $130 trillion every year. So, you know, it makes sense. There is power there. But there's a lot of information to go through Mm -hmm. just the same way voting is, you know, and and you've really got to figure out your strategies for and your criteria, you know, who, Mm -hmm. where are you putting your money? What are your priorities? Mm -hmm. And uh, figuring out who is doing what? Um, Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's June. So it's Pride Month. Yeah. And um, a, a lot of people like me in the LGBTQ plus community have always during June been, you know, like, okay, which companies are really supporting this community? Who's doing what? And, you know, during June, every company suddenly got rainbow everything, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Uggs is selling trans pride f- uh, slides this year. Mm-hmm. But it's like, but what is Uggs doing for the trans community the other 11 months out of the year. And that's the kind of like research you've got to do when you're spending. And you can see yeah. online corporations trying to seize this moment with the Black Lives Matter movement. The same I do want to make a comment, though, real quickly about companies um, maybe supporting one cause, but not necessarily supporting another. You brought up Starbucks and how their employees were discouraged from and told not to wear anything that promotes the Black Lives Matter movement. But meanwhile, there's still at least uh, a friend of mine who works at Starbucks was given a shirt for Pride Month and it's got like rainbow colors on it and it's great. So like Starbucks has always promoted the LGBTQ uh, community, but doesn't seem to 
want to well, deal with the political fallout of dealing with the Black Lives Matter community. Yes, and and actually, um, as of the the time of recording, I literally sorry, I don't mean to say deal with. That's not what I mean. I I just mean like. R- no, they, they don't necessarily want to toss their hat in the ring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's it's interesting that you bring up Starbucks because this is the perfect example of what we're talking about. Because as of time of recording right now, I just read an article while I was trying to uh, put my kid to sleep um, about how Starbucks got this massive pushback from people about the fact that, you know, it had leaked that they said you cannot wear anything supporting Black Lives Matter. So, of course, everyone is commenting on Instagram, on Twitter, saying things in stores, you know, what is this? You don't support Black Lives Matter. And what are they released today? We will be, within the month, providing all of our partners, that's a uh, Starbucks language for employees with an approved Black Lives Matter t-shirt from Starbucks. Well, look at that. Yeah, well, (laughs) look at that. The threat of boycotting a company. Well, Starbucks is already doing really, really badly right now, so. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it is the perfect example when you, all of these corporations right now are in a moment between COVID and the, I mean, just unemployment and you know the the lack mm-hmm. of being able to keep people on payroll they want to make us happy yeah. <laughs> and so we yeah. can give them feedback and uh you know we're not the only ones weaponizing it i think i, I told you about aurora james right mm-hmm. yeah uh for any of our listeners who may not know she's a designer uh from brooklyn uh, She designs for a brand or founded a brand called Brother Velas, and it's incredible. Shoe brand. She's dressed uh, several stars for the Met Gala. She's incredibly talented, Um, and her social media is very zen. (laughs) It will bring you focus and direction. But she also is focusing and directioning, uh, direct directioning. She's directing a lot of activism. Uh, in regards to commercial activism. Uh, She's really drawn on her resources in the fashion community and created something called the 15% Pledge. And it's really, really cool. Um, I I definitely can't put it in better words than she can. Do you mind if I, I quote her real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So she said... So many of your businesses are built on black spending power. So many of your stores are set up in black communities. So many of your sponsored posts are seen on black feeds. This is the least you can do for us. We represent 15% of the population and we need to represent 15% of your shelf space. Whole Foods, if you were to sign on to this pledge, it could immediately drive much needed support to black farmers. Banks will be forced to take them seriously because they will be walking in with major purchase orders from Whole Foods. Investors, for the first time, will start actively seeking them out. Small businesses can turn into bigger ones. Real investment will start happening in black businesses, which will be subsequently paid forward into our black communities. And so essentially, she's saying, all right, companies like Target, Walmart, Shopbop, Amazon... You, your shelves need to reflect the way that the American population is, and 15% need to be black businesses. And uh, as of re- time of recording, Sephora, Rent the One Runway, and uh, We Wore What have signed on, which is huge. Sephora is a massive chain. So I just I want to comment that the 15% population number is uh, si- source, excuse me, sourced from the census website. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she she didn't pull that number out of anywhere. It's 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 you know in my mind it's an extraordinarily reasonable demand. You know what I mean? Oh sure. It's, and, and something it's, that kind of stands out to me is just the idea still that banks don't take black business owners seriously. No, and they there's tons of anecdotal evidence for this, but mm-hmm. um. You know, there's people who have said that they've worked in banks and they've been told to knock 15 points off of a credit score of a black applicant. Um, But, you know, in in more data driven, there's a a recent study from the U.S. Federal Reserve that said that black business owners are twice as likely to be rejected for a loan. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, (laughs) 
by 2021, Nielsen ratings, Nielsen studies, it says that black spending power is going to be $1.5 trillion. Mm-hmm. So the the disparity there, the we'll take your money, but we don't want you to make any, is so obvious when you look at those numbers, you know? And that's also so historical, not to not to spend too long talking about this. And it might even be a little off course, but just always reflecting on Tulsa and Black Wall Street and how it was burnt to the ground in the 1920s. Yeah, it w- they mm-hmm. literally lit Black America's greatest achievement in economics at the time on fire. They literally mm-hmm. bombed it to you know, put that down to stop progress. Sure, sure, because it's a threat to white American capitalism. Um, You said here, and and heard the quote from her, Whole Foods. Yes. um, As as a as a company that should source from uh, black farmers. I'm going to go way off course from our current point, but kind of on track towards what we want to talk about tonight and uh, transition here with Whole Foods got a lot of flack from their community for using prison labor uh, to make goat cheese was one of the items. Yeah. And and when you hear prison labor, you know, it's one of those things that on social media, they're like, you shouldn't buy from these places because they use prison labor. And I got to admit, I was absolutely like, yeah, no, prisons are the new slavery. And I wasn't wrong. I mean, historically, they they are. They are. They're the new slavery. But I don't think the cause is prison labor. And I didn't realize that until I really delved into the nuance here with you. Yeah. And I mean, this is one of those things where like, we want to say very, very ardently ahead of time, like prison labor. I'm going to bleep that out. But like, and no. prisons and all of that system. But there I are... Am, I'm 1000% in favor of abolishing the prison system as it exists and creating <laughs> something new and ethical and like, like a phoenix, it'll rise. Or yes, that is all I want. Fit all for I a, want fit for a democratic society. I just but, want us to help people be better. Uh, That's all I want. Yeah. Uh, I don't but, want. Yeah. This. <laughs> but let's let's do like a little brief history here about prison labor, starting with, of course, Amendment Thirteen. Um, which abolished slavery. Which abolished slavery. And I just want to make sure I have my notes now. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So uh, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. But within the amendment, it said slavery is abolished. But with with the caveat that slavery is legal as punishment for a crime. Yeah. And then cue the Reconstruction era, post-Civil War era. And then suddenly black men are arrested disproportionately for, for crimes that would be considered not crimes by today's standards spitting in the street sure you know a lot of things were suddenly yeah yeah. a lot of things were suddenly felonies yeah and in addition to that the people who are doing the arresting the police especially in the south were once the slave patrols of the South. So Mm -hmm. that mindset didn't change. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, you know, the 13th Amendment freed the slaves, but the mindset of the South especially didn't really change. Sure, yeah. Um, And there is something I want to quote. I'll I'll say here, 1880. In 1880, blacks were 13% of the U.S. population and 29% of the total population. And in 1923, blacks were 10%. Total prison population. Total prison population. Thank you. And in 1923, blacks were 10% of the U.S. population and 32% of the jail population. Um, So again, you've got a disproportionate number of black people arrested they're being exploited for labor i mean in the 1800s prison labor private private industry used prison labor to make 
items, you know. Um, then you've and got, to break break uh, strikes, right? Yeah, to break strikes. Yeah, that's fascinating on its own. A, comp- a, a mining company would go on strike and then they just bring in prisoners to do the work for free. For free and probably less regard for their safety, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, there's a very, very solid precedent in the idea that prison labor is slavery, slavery, and it's, it's historical and it's documented. But throughout the 1900s, there were a lot of calls for reforms. And mm-hmm. by the 1970s, the reform called the Justice System Improvement Act required private contractors to pay prison laborers minimum wage. Which is, this is, this is where my point of view on this Mm -hmm. began to be so complicated Mm -hmm. because the idea that a prisoner can get a job in prison and earn minimum wage at the very least and, you know, save money so that when he gets out, he's got a, a skill Mm -hmm. He, you know, that he can put on his resume. He's got a little bit of savings that he can go out and use, you know, get an apartment or buy food or whatever. Or at least, like, help use to pay for better legal counsel. Yeah. Like, there's, you know, know, the idea behind it sounds kind of rad when you think about it like that. Mm -hmm. But then... (laughs) But then, <laughs> but then we find out why it still sucks. Um, because you know, like many regulations put down by Congress, when it actually gets implemented, it doesn't go well. <laughs> well, it just goes without actual oversight. And so, I read an article. It was an op-ed by Chandra Bozalko. Um, she wrote writes for writes the blog excuse me prison diaries she was in prison for six years and she wrote an op-ed that was titled i don't have what it's titled but basically it's like do you think prison do you think prison labor is a form of slavery think again and basically her argument as somebody in prison who was having something to do in prison is a solace Having some way to spend your time outside of your cell is is good. And yeah. it is good in ways that are, like, statistically documented. It reduces uh, prison recidivism. It reduces internal rioting, you know, uh, dissent, things like that. It, I'm sure it makes, it's better for your mental health. It's better for mental health, etc. And so she says in her article... It's federal law that a private contracted company pays a prisoner a minimum wage. If they don't make minimum wage, it's not the fault of the business. It's the fault of the prison system. And and here's the 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 nuance Mm -hmm. that, you know, we've talked about in the past. The the issues with social media activism is it doesn't capture nuance really Mm -hmm. well. And. You know, it, it's really hard to to chant, you know, uh, reform, specifically prison system administration. You know, like it, it's, it's yeah. not sexy. It's not easy to chant and it's yeah. not easy to put on a slide for Instagram. And this is where I really was like, OK, I like the guy making minimum wage. I hate the fact that a prison is not giving it to him, you know, sure. and I- list their reasons why. And and they're not giving it to him because they're they're billing him for his stay, like he's at the Holiday Inn. Instead, he's getting billed for you know his food, his uh, are we calling them accommodations? You know what I mean? Well, like, it's it's some states have a pay to stay where you're required to pay for your prison stay. Stay not all states, but then most other states will withhold from your paycheck just to help cover the cost of your stay even though you're not being charged the cost of your stay and then they also withhold on your paycheck to cover the cost of victim uh restitution restitution thank you and potentially child support and things like that so by the time you're getting paid it's like cents on the dollar 
Yeah, I think they were saying the average prisoner who works in prison is something like 76 cents an hour. Yeah. I do want to say, though, Tabby, um, we'd, we'd, we'd brought up the how activism online is there's a lot of subtleties that you have to pay attention to. But I, I would almost say the private sector, even though they are paying minimum wage, they know that the prison's not giving the prisoner their full income. Yeah. And they take advantage of the sure. contract still. Yeah. But and that question, would almost be enough for to like boycott it for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. this was something that was brought up in that Starbucks article that I literally just read. Um mm. was people were questioning Starbucks on social media about uh their use of prison labor. Mm-hmm. And apparently it had to do with their packaging, I believe, mm-hmm. is what they contracted out to to the prisons. Um And they had broken this contract because of bad press recently. And so people are asking them for the nitty gritty and and Starbucks is being, you know, I don't want to say held accountable because obviously we can say it's it's a very complex issue, but they're being questioned about it. And so it's almost like it's not worth the trouble for them, Mm. which is causing some brands to cease like Whole Foods stopped using the the prison labor for the goat cheese um, for that reason. Yeah, because you can never actually explain it. Yeah, you know, some poor Starbucks media manager who absolutely has nothing to do <laughs> with the prison yeah. labor contract <laughs> is not going to be able to explain the complexities of this on Instagram. No. Nor can Starbucks justify the fact that they're not pressuring prison officials to pay these people, you know. But, but they can't. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that ultimately becomes like the crux of the issue is having something to do in prison is is a benefit right now i would argue that packaging starbucks isn't a skill you know giving yeah. somebody the ability to like work on small engines is a skill giving somebody the ability sewing. to sewing or yeah, victoria's classes. secret still uses prison labor although so. to be honest sewing like when you when you get out of prison you're not going to go work somewhere sewing clothing because that's not an industry really right no, I mean, well, the way that they do it for Victoria's Secret is it's very assembly line. So yeah. they could technically get a job in another, you know, mass produced textile facility. Okay, yeah. um, you know, it's not it's not custom tailoring. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but, yeah, they're they're not. The, the Starbucks- there should be a focus on teaching people skills like life skills. And there should be a focus on if somebody wants to get an education have them having the ability to get an education. And then I guess the other like insurmountable reform that has to happen outside of prison is the ability for somebody with a felony charge to get a job. And felony charges can be given for the smallest of crimes. Yeah, what uh, you were telling me this earlier, how much is a felony charge? Like how much is the dollar amount that you have to have stolen in value in Florida? Uh, in Florida, I think it's seven hundred fifty or nine hundred dollars. That that's, that's an not interesting even an iPhone. point. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I can tell you right now. Actually, seven hundred and fifty dollars. This was updated in two thousand nineteen. So, felony theft has a dollar amount, and the dollar amount is different depending on the state you're living in, and the dollar amount is increased haphazardly as well so some states like alaska uh, they have a dollar amount that goes up every year with inflation so the cost of like theft for felony crime in alaska is a thousand dollars uh contrast that to new jersey and this this might help explain a lot of problems in New Jersey, but <laughs> <laughs> they don't pump their own gas at the beginning yeah. of it. No, how yeah, much is right. a felony? <laughs> so to be charged with a felony in New Jersey for theft, the item has to be worth two hundred dollars or more. This was last updated in nineteen seventy eight. Like for reference, a decent microwave is $200. Like, 
This yeah. is not the uh, the reason I bring that up. Like I, I, I sound facetious, but you know, it's the stupid crimes you commit when you're a teenager sure, and you don't exactly. know any better. You know, and like you're 13, you're you just steal a phone because you're 13. Not defending people who steal, but just saying children and young adults make mistakes. They do stupid stuff, and, and to get a know, felony charge at that age and then hope to achieve anything is so so difficult it's you know there is an extreme prejudice against ex-cons in this com- a country mm-hmm. and you don't hire ex-cons as a rule like it, mm-hmm. it is a consideration that big companies do they just you know i worked in lots of big corporate food service industry companies and they're just like nope 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 whenever they'd see that box checked off on an application and now that i'm you know a grown adult i'm like that's horrible but i didn't know any better at 20 well yeah Um, and then think about it 200 dollars petty theft is a felony charge in new jersey yeah how is anybody going to get beyond that yeah you can't and when you add to the fact that disproportionately these people who are arrested and put in prison are you know um, brown or black you've got that double-edged sword you've got that way of keeping these people down even more sure and it's it's not necessarily an issue of petty crime what did you say to me about crimes of desperation oh okay i'm gonna butcher this statistic but i was watching a a cnn special on this and they said that something in the 80 percent range of crimes in this country are considered desperation crimes, meaning you are driven to this crime because of your circumstances, not because of desire. You join a gang mm-hmm. because of your circumstances. You steal somebody's wallet because of your circumstances. You break into somebody's house because of your circumstances. You hold up a store because of your circumstances. They are crimes of desperation, not like sure. premeditated. You know, sure. you're not a and serial desperation killer. Desperation predisposes people to certain mindsets. Absolutely. You Absolutely. Know? And and so, you know, you've got a huge chunk of people who are in prison for crimes they probably would not have been inclined to commit had they had a more fortunate set of circumstances. Or you have people in prison for crimes they committed that are no longer considered crimes. Exactly. Yes. Like in California, there are thousands of inmates that are sitting in prison for marijuana charges mm-hmm. when you can walk into a corner store now and buy a joint. It's yes. ridiculous. And enter Elon Musk's tweet uh, last week or so. Um, it's amazing how marijuana has gone from a felony charge to an essential business during a pandemic, like just right? the intent to sell marijuana. And it's just absolutely crazy and when people say well people need to pay for their crimes i don't really care that their wages are garnished when they're in prison well maybe all these people don't need to be in prison and your taxpayer dollars don't need to be that high because we don't need to keep people in there for stuff that's not considered a crime anymore it costs the united states 40 billion dollars a year to keep our prison system the way it is. $40 billion. That's an mm-hmm. astonishing amount of money. Mm-hmm. And it's essentially the way it is to keep up the status quo of, you know, pre-Civil War era white supremacy and capitalism. Mm-hmm. And that hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. And, you know... There's so many incentives for the federal government to not change anything. You know, first of all, you've got private corporations that are lobbying, you know, different lawmakers to keep things the way they are. But you've also got something that I had just learned about, which is prison gerrymandering, which is insane, which is essentially um, while inmates lose their right to vote and clearly lose their right to fair compensation – they all they don't lose their right to be counted on the census. Mm-hmm. And as we've covered in previous shows, the census is what determines how resources are allocated in the United States. So well, account- how how seats in the House of Representatives are I, Yes. 
Yes, exactly. So Mm -hmm. you've got counties that maybe have, uh, you know, a a tiny actual civilian population, but they've got, you know, 20,000, 30,000 inmates in that county. And so they're now getting the proportional representation and resources as if of they all had of those this people. massive population. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that county has no incentive to change the status quo and, and report correctly. They'd lose, you know, a giant chunk of their resources and, and sure, representation sure. in Congress. Yeah. That prison gerrymandering is, I literally learned about that today. And that is so insane. It's gross. Like mm-hmm. much of our prison system, it's gross. You know, yeah. we... I could I could go into rant mode, but well, I, I really you in- do. <laughs> <laughs> Is it before you do? Yes, I do want to bring up one topic, and I really I don't know enough about it to reflect on it for too long, but it is it is deserving of a mention, and that is for profit prison systems. Mm-hmm. Yes, and how ultimately people lobbying for those too want to keep the prison system. In the status quo. Yeah. the if, So a lot of th- this is, again, something that's weirdly hard to to learn about, because, first of all, it's done a, do- a dozen different ways. Um, so it, it's not something I can say I understand the nuance e- of either. But essentially, it's private companies take over the administration of mm-hmm federal prisons. And they are no longer, you know, a federal prison in the sense that they're run by the federal government. And these prisons have contract or these prison companies have contracts with the US government and are making money. Mm-hmm. So and they are in turn, by the way, making money off of those corporate contracts for jobs, you know, so it, it makes it still very kind of dirty. Um, you know, it's a company that is literally keeping people caged. Mm-hmm. That's that's so counter to everything I've been taught in ethics that it's hard for <laughs> me to kind of rationalize it. Right. And that brings us to, like, the whole title of the show, The Moral Implications of the Prison System, where, you know, how do you even define what crime is when what is considered a crime today next year couldn't be considered not a crime. I mean, the perfect example is possession of marijuana within a certain weight, right? Crime 10 years ago, federal crime 10 years ago, now not a federal crime. And I do want to bring up the example of like felony theft thresholds, because what if next year they just decide to change the felony theft threshold in New Jersey from 200 unbelievable dollars to a thousand dollars now let's say last year you were arrested for something for 250 dollars and this year now it's one thousand dollar threshold don't you deserve to have potentially your felony conviction overturned or yeah or at least brought down to a misdemeanor or sure like should it ruin your life yeah exactly you know should your shouldn't that come into consideration Mm -hmm. but i feel like there's so little actual consideration for prisoners in this country people don't want to know people don't want to think about it it makes us feel bad to think about it or it or or it makes you feel the complete other way You, you know people are so divided on how they feel about somebody who has air quotes committed a crime because you either think they deserve to pay or you think they can be fixed. Yeah. And and from those two arguments come this, you know, this this logic tree of well, if they can be fixed, then everything we're doing is inhumane and horrible and we need to completely change it, which is, sure. you know, I will admit kind of the the side I'm on. Um, but then you've got the uh, other side that's like, uh, no. So yeah, really? Sorry. I mean, I <laughs> Anybody who's ever heard us talk us ever. Any idea that I'm a flaming liberal <laughs> who wants to save the world. Um, <laughs> but no, the other side then is saying, well, no, they are bad people. Bad people commit crimes. We can't fix bad people. They need to pay their debt to society, mm-hmm. you know, in a very literal way. Yeah. Yeah. But I just philosophically, what is a crime anymore? 
You know? Yeah. What What is a crime when our moral code is changing? When it was a crime to be gay fifty sure. years ago in some places. When oh today, my God, yes, loving, the Loving case. It Loving Day. Okay, full disclosure for anyone listening. We recorded this on Loving Day, uh, which of course is when. Uh, the Lovings versus Virginia won the right to be married. It was the first legal interracial marriage in the state of Virginia. A huge step forward for this country. That was illegal. It was illegal to marry someone who wasn't your skin color. They spent time in jail for being in love. Mm. Now we look back and we're like, what the hell? Mm. And that could easily happen to dozens of things we com- consider crimes today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it really does make you question how we handle law and order in this country. Sure. When so much sure. of it is arbitrary, you know, kind of cultural morality based. Yeah. Well, with that said, um, I think we can we can start to wrap it up. The, the point of the show was ultimately, like when we started to talk about it, the point of the show was we talked about how voting is a form of protest last week. And this week we wanted to talk about how spending your money is a form of protest. And we ended up really getting deep into like just how crazy prison is. But um, again, just because the momentum is slowing down and we've moved from our sprint into our marathon doesn't mean it's time to just start going back into your normal day to day. No, Uh, there are changes you can make um, Mm -hmm. to your life that will make an effect that will continue this momentum. Um, I highly suggest personally that if you have the means uh, dedicating a small financial commitment to a organization of your choice, even $15 a month, if that is something that an organization like Black Lives Matter or bail funds or things like that in your area can count on, that prolongs the movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, A big lump sum right now is wonderful. But knowing that they have people that are committed to a financial investment in their long-term actions is also important. Secondly, and, um, oh yes, go on. Kind of piggyback in, piggybacking off of what we were saying about ethical shopping, uh, I found two Chrome extensions that I really like. <laughs> Uh, and I really want to recommend people check them out. They're both uh, they're both have the same premise, which is when you're Googling things you want to buy online, um, they kind of do the work for you of, is this company you want to buy from an ethical company? Uh, the first one is called Done Good, and um, they, you know, in the upper right-hand side, when you're Googling things, will provide small business alternatives to big business, big box business Uh, items. Um, They prioritize your Google search towards ethical brands and they give you discounts. They've negotiated discounts with ethical brands. So if you have a done good extension, it'll be like, hey, here's a 20% coupon to, you know, mom and pop dogleashes.com. And that's awesome. It incentivizes you to spend that money. And as of 2020, they show brands that have donated to Donald Trump. So you can do with that information as you would like. <laughs> uh, there is a second one, which is just called Ethical Shopper. And uh, this was cool because it's uh, not just politics and small business geared, but it's uh, it rates brands based on how ethical and sustainable they are for people the planet, and animals. So, you know, uh, I think I've talked in the past about how, you know, veganism might be great for animals, but it can be really, really bad for brown people. And this uh, extension kind of goes, yeah, it's got five stars for animals, but hey, they're not paying these people anything. And that's a really important tool for your consideration. So Mm -hmm. I really like this uh and it also provides context on how these companies get those ratings and we'll we'll post the links for both of these extensions in the notes for the show yes Mm -hmm. um and you know they're chrome extensions so they uh can on occasion be a pain in the butt and you might have to restart your computer but highly recommend and also um just want to 
just want to point out the elephant in the room. They're Chrome extensions, so they're only going to work on Chrome. Yes, yes. <laughs> they will only work on Google Chrome, so I did have to download Chrome. It's not like Chrome when I try to, to open Netflix Party and Safari all the time. Like, <laughs> Yes, exactly. Like Unfortunately, you'll have to use Chrome. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh. But um, we are going to try to keep providing you with tools throughout this movement and research throughout this movement. And we are so grateful that you are still tuning in. Um, We're trying to use our platform responsibly. We hope that you continue to use yours, no matter how small your community, just having the discussions is so important. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll, we'll chime in and see you hopefully next week, if not the week after. Our shows keep falling kind of in the two week range now with everything the way it is. Um, kids being home from school, all the roommates being home from work, and you know, yeah, yeah, it gets a little oh, hard. It does. You know, we did try try recording a little earlier this evening, and uh, yay, my daughter asked to use the restroom instead of just you know having an accident mid nap. But unfortunately, we had to stop recording, and those yeah. are the kinds of challenges that we face now. So thank you for being so patient. Yeah. <laughs> But in the meantime, we will chat with you soon, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Good night. Good night.